Let's get back now to what we were examining. And so we have the separate, we have the separatists as represented by chiefly by John Robinson, who was the pastor of the pilgrims. The pilgrims that being the pilgrims being among the separatists. And finally, now there is some controversy among Baptist historians, but I would say this would also include the Baptists. I'm one, yes, I'm one of these who would argue that the, that the English-speaking Baptist descent really came out of, out of English separatism uh, with, only, with only superficial uh, contact with the, uh, with the Anabaptists. And so in that regard, I would include among these people John Smith, Thomas Hellis, and Henry Jacob. Um, you know, John Smith, yes, he led a group of separatists to the Netherlands, and he made contact with the, some, you know, some Dutch Anabaptists, and he eventually joined them. But it was Thomas Hellis who brought that group back with him to England and started the very first Baptist church in England. So for that, so that would be one of the reasons why I would classify Baptists as, well, to use a politi the political spectrum as an example, I would classify the Baptists as left-wing Puritans. They are separatists. They give up on the entire institution of the entire uh, church-state uh, institution. But they even go beyond the separatists who are mentioned here, to the point where they will even reject uh, infant baptism. Because the separatists and the independents, they still retained, just as the Episcopalians and other moderate Puritans, infant baptism. Now, at this point, that kind of gives us the big picture in terms of the various groups of Puritans, all of whom are in one way or another, even the separatists and the Baptists are concerned with what this, this uh, church in England is going to ultimately look like. Now this brings us to the, you know, to the monarch whose reign is going to provoke even more uh, strident reaction from various Puritan groups. And that is Charles I. Now, Charles I was the son of uh, James I of England. Uh, James dies in 1625, and he is succeeded by his son, Charles I. Now, Charles I was, was very devout. He, was, he considered himself a, a, a devout, uh, faithful follower, a uh, member of the Church of England. And he took his, he took his role, he took his play, he took his role with, it, with respect to royal supremacy very, very seriously. Now in the meantime, he offended many in England in many ways. One, he married a Catholic, uh, a French Catholic by the name of Henrietta Maria. She was, uh, she was part of the royal family of France. Charles himself, for lack of a better word, although it's a bit more nuanced than this, but for our sake here, uh, he, had, he at least had, seemed to have Arminian tendencies. Many, uh, uh, many, uh, of the churchmen in the Church of England were, were very reformed, especially in their view of salvation. Election, uh, salvation by grace alone, and so forth, with little or with, with, no, uh, with no role of, uh, in, in human participation, or no role in free will and things like this. So, but uh, Charles had some leanings toward, he at least had some Arminian leanings. But then, to really, uh, to really seal all this, he appointed the very controversial William Laud as Archbishop of, Con of Canterbury. Now, William Laud entertained similar theological views as, uh, as Charles, but he 
And, all, and to be fair to Laud, he is very much, uh, he is not, he is very much anti, uh, anti-Rome, but there's a lot of what Rome has that he does appreciate and wants to reintroduce them into the Church of England. So one of these, for instance, is to replace the Lord's table, the communion table, with an altar. That would be one of the things that he would want to do. Now, let's, get, let's discuss some of the actions that uh, Archbishop Laud takes with the full approval of Charles I, because these actions are going to uh, provoke a war with Scotland, which will eventually mutate into a civil war in England. So, so Laud, as you see here in your notes, he was concerned with, he was concerned with uh, reverence. And he believed that that reverence in the church could best be demonstrated by restoring even more of uh, some of the traditional late medieval Catholic ceremonial that had been abolished even by the Elizabethan settlement. So even among, and by the way, even among other, other, uh, you know, other churchmen who are part of the establishment, who supported Episcopacy and so forth, there are many of them who opposed Laud on that. So as I said, Laud's a very controversial figure, but he's making these very controversial moves, as we just mentioned. So. Towards that end, he ordered another revision of the Book of Common Prayer, which would reflect those kinds of reintroduction of uh, traditional late medieval Catholic ceremony and so forth. Along with this, Laud further restricted preaching. He further restricted preaching. Either the book of homilies, uh, to either the book of homilies or no, pre, or no sermon at all. For the same reason that others were concerned with, and that was if you, if you give too much free reign to preaching, there is going to be the risk of someone fomenting disorder. He also reissued uh, James the first book of sports. James I uh, uh, issued what was called the Book of Sports in 1618, and then Laud himself, with the approval of Charles I, reissued it in 1633. Well, what was that about? Well, the whole Book of Sports had to do with the church establishment saying that it was perfectly okay for people to engage in various recreations on the Sabbath. So as long as you went to church, as long as you went, you know, as long as you went to church, at the beginning, it was okay what you it was okay what you did afterwards. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to attend races and things like this, and participate in other games after church, it was perfectly okay to do that because of certain uh, freedoms that one enjoys in Christ. So that was kind of the that was the main point of the book of sports. There were many there were many uh, many churchmen among the Puritans who strongly opposed this and believed in a much much more strict observance of the Sabbath. And so when Archbishop Laud, with the approval of Charles I, reintroduced this and reissued this, then that caused even more controversy. Now, Laud is doing all of this in England. Now remember, under Charles I, who is the king of both England and Scotland, Laud now did all this with respect to England. Now he wants to direct his attention to Scotland. Now Scotland is strongly Presbyterian. Laud is not happy with that. Laud thinks that there needs to be absolute and total conformity of religion throughout the entire realm, which would include both the kingdoms of England and Scotland. 
So Scotland, so since we, we affected all these different uh, other types of reforms uh, for England, we need to do the same thing for Scotland because the church in Scotland needs to be just like the church in England for the sake of uniformity. For the sake of uniformity, under the, supremacy, under the uh, ecclesiastical supremacy of the monarch. So, towards that end, Laud tries to impose this revised Book of Common Prayer with the addition of these um, newly reintroduced late medieval Catholic ceremonial things onto Scotland. Needless to say, the Scots don't... The Scots don't appreciate it. So there's a huge, so in response, so they're in Edinburgh where he tries to, where they, where, uh, where he tries to have it imposed. There is huge, huge resistance. There is violent resistance uh, in, beginning in Edinburgh. As a matter of fact, the story is told uh, that in the cathedral, in St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, when the when a priest is, is trying to implement the service by way of the new prayer book, there was a lady who got so enraged over what he was doing, she took a stool and smacked him right square in the head with it. But needless to say, the Scots were not happy about this. You have no right whatsoever to impu- to alter our religion, the form of which we've been practicing now for quite a few decades. And so to protest this, the Scots, as you see here in your notes, instituted the National Covenant in 1638. The National Covenant in 1638, in which they all pledged before God that they would not alter by any means the form of religion that they, that they have practiced up until this time, which is strongly Presbyterian, strongly Reformed, uh, according to a Genevan understanding of it. Now, in the meantime, the Scots aim to punctuate their point by invading England to the north. So now, Charles I has a war on his hand, has a potential war on his hands because of the actions of his archbishop. So, what does, well, what does Charles need to do? Well, he needs to call Parliament. Problem. He dissolved Parliament in 1628 because he acted fully on this idea of, divine, of the divine right of kings. Uh, Charles believed that he could govern single-handedly without Parliament. So in 1628, Charles I dissolved Parliament and ruled for 12 years single-handedly without Parliament. But now we need, but now uh, he needs Parliament because he needs money to raise an army to defend the northern border of England against the Scots. So he summons Parliament in 1640 and this Parliament, gentlemen, is going to be known as the Long Parliament. The Long Parliament. So he summons the Long Parliament, what's going to be the Long Parliament, to request taxes so that he can, so he can get the revenue necessary to raise an army. Here's the problem. The Parliament may... Uh, which consists, especially in the Commons, which consists of a lot of people sympathetic to the Puritans, are, symp- are in sympathy with the Scots. Because they didn't like, La- they, didn't, they did not appreciate Laud imposing this prayer book on the Scots either. So, so Parliament is going to take advantage of the position that they believe has been providentially handed to them. All right, all right, your majesty, you want money? 
you want permission to uh, to raise ta to raise additional taxes so you can get this army. Well, we're going to do a few things. We're going to we're going to pass all kinds of legislation that's going to restrict your power. Moreover, we're going to deal with this archbishop you appointed who's caused all these problems. So what they do is the parliament takes it upon itself to arrest Archbishop Laud, which they did. They put him in prison and oh about four or five years later they execute him in 1645 for treason. Now also as a, condi as, as a condition for helping out the king, Parliament now passes a whole series of legislation that, as I said, is going to limit the king's power. Essentially, the types of, uh, pa the types of legislation they passed in this regard would reduce the king to something of a chief executive, kind of like the, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of like a prime minister or a, or a president. Okay, you may, all right, you are going to, you could you could rule, you can reign, but you're going to be a, you're just going to be a chief executive. You'll propose legislation, and we'll decide whether it passes or not. That's it. You are you, king, are going to be beholden to Parliament as the representative body of the entire realm. But then they move on from that to reforming the church. Remember, we have Puritans. And remember what the Puritans were about, regardless of whether they were, uh, whether they were uh, moderate. Well, the separatists aren't even included, a lot of the separatists aren't even included in Parliament. But the ones really calling the shots here in Parliament at this point among the Puritans are what we call those moderate Puritans. So it doesn't matter at this point if they are, if they're Presbyterian or independent. You had some Episcopalians there, but a lot, of, a lot of the members of parliament are either Presbyterian or independent. Well, now they see their chance. All right? We are, as parliament, we're going to take it upon ourselves now as the representative body in the entire realm to reform the institutional church. And here's what we're going to do. One, we're going to pass the root and, bran the root and branch bill. And what that does, and then what that does is that remove that that essentially ends episcopacy. We're going to end episcopacy. We're going to replace it with a Presbyterian form of church government. Well, the independents may like that, may not like that, but tough. The Presbyterians are are the majority. Too bad. The then we have the then we have the. Uh, then we have the grand, then we have the grand remonstrance, which uh, makes further, which then makes simply just makes further reforms along um, along the kind of agenda that uh, especially the Presbyterians and the Independents in Parliament wanted. And then finally, they call the Westminster Assembly. It's time now that we make the doctrine defining the Church of England more specific and more precise, even beyond what is written in the 39 Articles. Now, so the Westminster Assembly has been given that task. Now, originally, when the Westminster Assembly met, as you can see here, they met between 1643 to 1649, their main their, their main object originally was to revise the 39 Articles. That was their original, that was their original task. And the original task was to, <clears throat> yeah, the original task was to revise the 39 Articles, and they got as far as about, they got as far as about Article, to, uh, to about Article 8. And that's because of a change in political events. The English Parliament, in or, the English Parliament, in order to conduct its, in order to conduct its campaign. Now, let me just back up a little bit. 
in response to a lot of this, a lot of this other legislation uh, restricting the king's power, the king took the bold action of dissolving parliament. This was his reaction to the legislation that was being, uh, that was being passed that would have limited his authority to just simply being that of a chief executive. We're getting, rid of, we're getting rid of this over here, which then becomes the basis for him to rule absolutely without, the, without uh, Parliament. Well, his reaction was, again, he's going to do in 1640 what he did in 1628. He goes back with his troops, with his army. They bust into the, they bust into the Hall of Parliament. They bust into the House of Commons. With the king present, and right then and there, he officially dissolves Parliament. And that results in the Civil War. Now, so now we have, so now we have the king fighting the Scots, and now his forces are fighting other Englishmen led by the forces of Parliament. Now, so it's under those circumstances then that the long Parliament is still in place. They refuse to budge, they reconvene, and they, call, they summon the Westminster Assembly. This was an assembly of uh, English theologians. We call them the Westminster Divines, who began revising the, art, the 39 Articles. But then they need help from Scotland to wage their war against, uh, against the king. So the Scots now, who are in the driver's seat, tell the English Parliament... If you want our help, you're going, to make some you're going to make some changes in both the government of the church and in your confession. You're going to come up with a confession of faith that will be agreeable to the Reformed churches, not only uh, obviously in England, but also in Scotland and in Ireland. It's going to be, we're going to have one uniform confession of faith for all three kingdoms. And alongside with that, you're going to have, we're going to have a unified church government that's going to be Presbyterian. And that's going to be, so the same church government, in, so that the, what the church government is in Scotland is going to be the same church government for England as well as Ireland. And that was the whole gist of what we call the Solemn League and Covenant in, uh, in 1643. So it's because of the Solemn League and Covenant which, which kind of mandated this. Okay, we'll give you help to carry on the Civil War with the king if you in turn agree to come up with one uniform confession of faith that would be for the, the, the kingdoms of England, Scotland, and Ireland. So that's what they so the par, so then Parliament agreed to that, and then that is when the Westminster Assembly's task shifted from revising the 39 Articles to producing a whole new Confession of Faith. And as we know, the the we know that the result of that will be the Westminster Confession of Faith, completed in 1648. In the meantime. This, re, this kind of reform that the Scots wanted was going to be comprehensive. So in this regard, they came up with the Direction of Government, Worship, and Discipline. We call that simply the Directory of Worship. And that document re attempted to reestablish the Church of England as a Presbyterian church with worship and with worship and church discipline being practiced according to what was already being done on the continent and in Scotland. Then, in 1647, the Westminster Assembly completed the Shorter Catechism, which is familiar to many of us as well as the Larger Catechism. So the Shorter Catechism in 1647, the Larger Catechism in 1648, and in that same year, finally, the Westminster Assembly completed the confession, the confession of faith in 1648. Now, unfortunately, despite all this work, it never, 
because of the political disruptions instituted by Crom initiated by Cromwell later on, which we'll get into in just a little bit, these never, these never became official documents uh, for the entire uh, Church of England. Although they've been used by Presbyterians ever since. Now we come, now very quickly, we come to the course of the Civil War. Now the Civil War was waged between two sides. The first, were the, the first were the Royalists, those who were fighting for Charles I. They're known as the Cavaliers, and their headquarters was at Oxford. Um, then we have the parliamentary forces who were called the Roundheads. Now they were called the Roundheads because of their bull, because of their bull cuts. The Cavaliers, who were members of nobility, had long flowing hair, and the parliamentary, and the parliamentary forces, who were mostly commoners, had, uh, had bowl cuts. So you put a bowl, put a bowl on their head, take a pair of scissors, you cut around it, and there's your bowl cut. Yeah, that, I'm not kidding. That's, that's, what, that's what it was. And, and uh, in, the, in, in the U.S., they still practiced, they had still practiced that as, oh, as late as, uh, as late as the 1970s. When, so when a kid needed a haircut and they couldn't afford they couldn't afford a barber. They take a bull, put it on the kid's head, take a pair of scissors, and then cut around it. Well, the Roundheads or the Parliamentary Forces are led by Oliver Cromwell. Now, there are obviously many battles are fought during this period of the Civil War, but in, but there are, but in 1644. Uh, now, for a while, the uh, you know the the, uh, the Roundheads combined with the Scottish forces defeated the Royalist forces at the Battle of Marston Moor. So that was in 1644, and this was made possible because uh, Cromwell had improved the performance of the army, and so the army that uh, Cromwell had improved was called the New Model Army. And so because of the improvements that were made in the army, they were able to effectively defeat, with the help of the Scots, uh, the royalist forces there at Marston Moor. And this new model army became the official army for Parliament. Now that Charles was defeated militarily, he came up with other means of trying to defeat their cause in the interest of his, and that is he was now using political maneuvers and things like this to sow dissension among his opponents. So he's trying to pit the Scots, for instance, against, uh, you know, against the parliamentary forces. He's trying to sow, he's trying to use political means by uh, sowing discord among uh, the different groups in Parliament, and, he's, and he does that through a whole array of agents and, and people like that. Well, eventually, Charles tries to, Charles tries to uh, establish a special alliance with the Scots and carry on a second civil war which he does, and they lose against the forces of Parliament, and then for this reason, Charles I is arrested. He's tried for treason, and he's executed in 1649. The first and really only uh, British monarch who would, be, who would be executed in this way. Well, who would be, well, who'd be deposed and executed at all like this. And so, at that point, Cromwell becomes head of the government as Lord Protector, and with the and then with the aid of Parliament, he he the monarchy is abolished. So the monarchy so the monarchy is abolished, and eventually Charles uses the new model army to dispense to get rid of Parliament. 
to get rid of Parliament because they refused to stand for they refused to stand for re-election. And also Cromwell was not a Presbyterian. Cromwell was an independent. And so as an independent, he did not want to see Presbyterianism become the national form of church government. He was an independent, and so as a result of this, uh, and also because uh, uh, Parliament was acting in ways that uh, Cromwell thought were illegal, he then disperses Parliament in 1652. And there, he governs almost single-handedly as Lord Protector. And his, uh, Cromwell's protectorate uh, was a type of, well, was a type of military dictatorship. I mean, to put it as to put it in, in the simplest terms possible. Now, in ter now in terms of his religious, in terms of the religious policies that Cromwell pursued as Lord Protector, one under his, under under his leadership, all of the ecclesiastical legislation that was related to the Elizabethan settlement was repealed. He did away with a centralized national church and replaced it uh, with one that consisted only of local autonomous churches. Again, he's an independent. The Book of Common Prayer is outlawed, although there are, although there are some uh, who are very uh, devout and very faithful to the Book of Common Prayer, who are meeting, who are meeting secretly to do uh, prayer book services. And, very importantly, he instituted a policy of religious toleration, which then allowed for the first time the proliferation of various other groups outside of the Church of England, like, well, like the Baptists. The Baptists actually did quite well uh, in terms of uh, developing congregations and growing them uh, really throughout England and even in Ireland as well, under, uh, under Cromwell's uh, leadership. Also, there were other groups that were not necessarily orthodox who also proliferated significantly. Uh, probably most prominent among these was a group called the Quakers. The Quakers were founded uh, in, the, in the 17th century by uh, George Fox and they were total subjectivists in many ways. The, the, the Quakers did not believe in the, in the authority of scripture. They did not really believe in the use of uh, sacraments or ordinances, depending on what term you prefer. Rather, they believe, in the, they believe that God communicated this through what they call the inner light. So, the, so in a typical Quaker meeting. They would all meet together. And there'd be no preaching, no reading of the Bible or anything like that. They'd sit there and they would meditate. And whichever one had something to say as a result of the Spirit prompting this inner light, then they would go up and say it. That's usually how a Quaker meeting went. But anyway, the Quakers were one of these kinds of groups that uh, grew significantly during a uh, uh, during this period of Cromwell's Commonwealth. Now, eventually, Cromwell's rule comes to an end in 1658 when he dies. Now, he is succeeded by his son Richard Cromwell. Now, Richard, to make a very long story short, proved that he did not have the, the administrative competence that his father had. So largely due to weakness, personal weakness and administrative incompetence, Parliament kind of got tired of this, and so they removed him. And in the meantime, Charles's, Charles I's family was living in exile in France. So the heir apparent is also, is also named Charles. And so Parliament calls Charles II, or the person who will be Charles II, back to England to take the throne. That's in 1660. Now we know this as the Restoration. 
as the restoration. Well, in 16, well, when, when Cromwell dies in 1658, Parliament is re-elected. Parliament is reconstituted after Cromwell's death. And in the meantime, it was Cromwell's son Richard who succeeded him. Well, Parliament, having been reseated, re-elected, you know, re reseated, saw how, saw his uh, saw Richard's lack of competence. And they saw a lot of weakness, and they and the parliament, and also obviously given the fact the parliament had been displaced by his father, um, they weren't terribly happy about that either. And so at the end of the day, the parliament thought that the monarch that they had was better. It needed to, there needed some cha some changes needed to be made, and they did make them. But at the end of the day, parliament thought that, mon that the monarchy was better, and this. Um, this quasi-military dictatorship that, uh, Crom that uh, Oliver Cromwell had led and that his son Richard was miserably failing at. So it's for that reason that the Parliament, which had been receded after, after, Crom after Oliver Cromwell's death, recalled the heir apparent, who's in exile in France, back to England to take the throne. And that's in 1660, and that is known as the Restoration. Yes, Mikey. Um, yes, Charles II has Catholic sympathies, but he himself still considers himself part of the Church of England. Now, you anticipate this really, your anticipation here, Mikey, is, is, quite, um, is quite spot on because Charles II's younger brother, James, who will be James II, is a Catholic. And that's going, to, uh, that's going to result in a lot of developments. So, the, so the, the monarchy is restored in 1660. But, not all, but this is called the Restoration, not just because the monarchy is restored, but the Church of England as it had been previously constituted before the Civil War, is now also reconstituted. Uh, along with the, along with the, uh, along with the a revised Book of Common Prayer, which, uh, which was published in 1662. And in 1662, well, that was all part of this act of, there's a whole new act of uniformity that's passed in 1662, which includes this revised uh, Book of Common Prayer of 1662. And that, by the way, it's the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, which technically is still considered the official Book of Common Prayer for the Church of England, although, although practically speaking, they'll use modern, they'll use various uh, modern liturgies and so forth, but, but technically, the 1662 Book of Common Prayer is the official Book of Common Prayer for the Church of England even today. But we have to remember too that as an independent, Cromwell pursued a policy of religious toleration. Maybe not even, maybe even more than religious toleration, we might actually call it some degree of religious liberty where the, ba where the Baptists along with the Quakers and other groups had free reign. They had unrestricted, they pretty much had unrestricted freedom to evangelize, uh, plant congregations. Also, there were many Baptists who fought the New Model Army and served in Cromwell's government. So this is probably the best time the Baptists had. Because the, ba because the, the Baptists are given uh, pretty much free reign in terms of what they were able to do which was all supported by Cromwell uh, in the name of um, religious freedom and toleration. However, though, Yepsica and everyone else, that all comes to an end in 1662. Because along with this act of uniformity, which then re restores the episcopacy, it restores uh, uh, another revised edition of the Book of Common Prayer, there's also the Clarendon Code, which 
outlawed all which outlawed all other groups outside the Church of England. And it also imposed an oath on every minister in the Church of England, meaning that you had to take an oath to support the world supremacy, the new world supremacy that came about as part of the, uh, of the Restoration. You also had to take an oath supporting, um, you know, supporting the prayer book, the Episcopacy, and so forth. And in order to preach, henceforth, you had to get a license from the bishop. This is where John, this is where John Bunyan gets in trouble. John Bunyan got in, well remember, what got John Bunyan in trouble and in jail for about 10 years, during which time he wrote the Pilgrim's Progress, was for preaching without a license from the bishop. So he was thrown in jail. You see, that's all, you see, now that's all part of the Clarendon Code. The Clarendon Code required license from a bishop, from the area bishop, before one can preach. And also, part, also as part of this, one then has to take an oath swearing the royal supremacy, swearing, the, um, you know, swearing that they will um, conduct services according to the revised uh, 1662 uh, Book of Common Prayer. And when this oath was administered to every minister in the, in, in, uh, in the Church of England, 2,000 of them refused to take the oath. 2,000 of them. And, consequently, those 2,000 were ejected from their pulpits. They were all forced out of the, uh, out of the churches uh, which they pastored. Now that, gentlemen, is called the Great Ejection. We're gonna, as we look at some of these Puritans, we're going to be coming across that again and again and again. We're going to be seeing that with Flavel, we're also going to be seeing that with Richard Baxter. Time and time again, we're going to see references to this great ejection. So, the great ejection, 1662, was when 2,000 ministers were literally removed from, were forcefully removed from their pulpits in their pastoral charges because they refused to take the oath that was mandated by the Clarendon Code. So those are the major, those are the, those are the major events that occurred during the reign of Charles II. The restoration of the monarchy, the Church of England as had been previously constituted via the a new Act of Uniformity, which included uh, you know, the reinstitution of the, of, the, of the Episcopacy and this revised Book of Common Prayer. And then right along with that was this Clarendon Code, which was going to enforce it uh, by way of an oath. And if you didn't take the oath and you were a minister in the Church of England, you were kicked out. Now there's an entire category of religious groups now that would be uh, outlawed, and, and this is the group known as uh, dissenters. So if you are not part of the Institutional Church of England, if you're a Presbyterian, if you're an Independent, or you're a Baptist, you're simply called a dissenter or a nonconformist. And you're, and you're now on the not-so-nice side of the law. Hence, John Bunyan spending 10 years in jail for preaching without a license from the bishop. Now, James the, I mean, Charles II reigns from 1660 to 1685. He dies in 1685. And he is succeeded by his younger brother, James II, also known as the Duke of York, after whom the American state of New York is named. Now, going, now I think it was, um, you know, Mikey, to, your, to the point that you earlier made, James II is a Catholic. He is, a, he is a committed Roman Catholic. 
Now, interestingly, at the time that James II comes to the throne, he is support, he's supported by those in the Church of England who would be pro-establishment. And we call, and from this point onward, we're going to just simply call them conformists. So the conformists are those within the Church of England who are very much pro-establishment. And he was, and again, James II was enthusiastically supported uh, by that group. Now, James II has an agenda. And that agenda is to quietly and gradually reintroduce Catholicism to England. He wants to gradually make England Catholic again. And so he does this incrementally. First, he reintroduces Catholics to top posts in the government, as well as the army and the universities. Now, as a result of some of the legislation that was passed late in Elizabeth's reign, again, because there were, there were Catholic attempts to overthrow her, not to mention the gunpowder plot against James I uh, in 1605, you know, the Catholics are, Catholicism is outlawed. And, and uh, as part of the enforcement for that, you know, Catholics are banned from the government. They're also banned from the military. They're banned from the universities. Well, James II reintroduces Catholics to all these places, the government, the army, and the universities. Also, James II by virtue of his authority given to him via royal supremacy, set up a special church court that would try special cases for Catholics and would find naturally in favor of Catholics. And then he issued, very controversially, the Declaration of Indulgence in 1688, which which allowed for Catholics to say whatever they wanted in speaking and in writing, but, very, but then very severely limited what one could say about Catholics, whether from the pulpit or whether in print or, anything, or any other medium of communication. And this, and this is going to meet with resistance by both conformists and nonconformists. This is one of the rare occasions, gentlemen, where Baptists and nonconformists, I mean, and conformists, uh, make common cause to combat this and protest it and everything else. Now, the final straw comes when James II's wife, his queen, gives birth to a son. And James is made it known that he's going to have his son baptized a Catholic. Now, if that were to happen, that would mean the next monarch would be Roman Catholic, and then that would more or less complete his, his uh, process of, restora of the restoration of England to a Catholic state. That was the last straw. That was the last straw. Parliament, re Parliament reacts to this. Par Parliament seeks to uh, remove him from. Parliament now seeks to remove him from office. Uh, there are there are protests. There is mass opposition all throughout the country. And uh, real and then um, James realizing that there's no way that he was going to withstand this uh, this massive opposition, abdicates from the throne and flees to France with his family. In the meantime, Parliament, and this brings us to the Glorious Revolution of 1688, Parliament calls William of Orange of the Netherlands, who is married to James II's daughter, Mary, to come to England and take the throne 
as a Protestant monarch. Now this is called now is now it's because this was a quote unquote revolution that involved little to no violence or bloodshed is called the glorious revolution. Some call it the bloodless revolution. But this is called this is called the, the glorious revolution of 1688, wherein Parliament then asks William of Orange, who's then married to uh, uh, James's daughter Mary, to come to the throne of England, and they are crowned as uh, King William and Mary, uh, respectively. And probably the most important thing that they accomplished, the mo uh, at least with respect to our concerns here, is that under, under William and Mary, the Act of Toleration is passed in 1689. And what the, what the Act of Toleration of 1689 accomplished was, is it, it, defined, it defined the rights and the status of Puritans and other, out, other groups outside the Church of England who would be called dissenters. So, in essence, what the Act of Toleration of 1689 did was, it accorded a limited right for various Puritan groups and other outside groups to worship, but at the same time, their societal benefits were severely limited. So, for instance, if one was not part of the Church of England, if one was not part of the Church of England, uh, he could not attend university. He could not attend university, nor could he hold any seat in government, including Parliament. And that would remain pretty much in place until the 19th century. And by the way, Catholics would also be included in this. So Baptists, Quakers, Presbyterians, Independents, as well as Catholics, they could worship, they could meet together and worship, that's fine. They have, they have the freedom to do that. But they just won't be able to fully participate in society. They're not going to be able to attend university, they're not going to be able to hold office. They're not going to be able to be in the army or anything like that. So any questions about this old read? Go ahead, uh, Yepsiga. Are you talking about the, the Clarendon Code? Uh, well, anyone who was, this would have, this would have, pertained those who were part of the Anglican, who, who were part of the Church of England, who were pastoring churches that were, that were, that were generally considered part of the Church of England. Now it just so happened because of Cromwell's policy of toleration, uh, we had, you, had numerous, you had numerous people of different persuasions pastoring churches. So you had Baxter, who was a Presbyterian, he had Richard Baxter was a Presbyterian pastoring a parish in, uh, uh, there in, uh, you know, there in, uh, in, Kittermin, in uh, Kidderminster. So you had, so you had, somebody, you had somebody like Baxter, you had people like Flavel who had Presbyterian leanings pastoring these churches. Well, they obviously don't agree, they're not going to agree with uh, Episcopacy, they're not going to agree with a strict adherence uh, to, a, to the revised uh, prayer book, so, by virtue of those kinds of convictions, they're not going to take the oath. And so they're going to, get, so they're going to be among those who are rejected. Um, um, so, with that said, you know, there were, at this time, because of Cromwell's policies, there were people of numerous persuasions pastoring churches that normally would have been part of the Church of England. And so as, a part, so as an effort to bring about uniformity and consistency, uh, enforcing uh, this act of uniformity, uh, there was going to be, there was this oath that everyone uh, pastoring a church affiliated with the Church of England was going to have to take. And if you didn't take it, you were going to be expelled from that church. And that's exactly what happened to about 2,000 of these ministers. Uh, Richard Baxter, Thomas Watson, uh, John, Fla uh, John Flavel, just to mention a few. 
we can make a few other points about Puritan theology in general. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to exhaustively cover Puritan theology in about 10 minutes. But, the, but again, um, there are, and while there, is, there, is di there are differences among the Puritans themselves, as we've outlined, there are some common elements that they have. There are some common elements of their theology. First, they all hold to the doctrine of sola scriptura. Scripture is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Even to the point where some of them held very uh, strongly to what is called the regulative principle with respect to worship. Meaning that if it's not in the New Testament, you don't use it. That's probably the simplest way to explain it. At least as they would have understood it uh, back here in the 17th century. So sola scriptura. Another, another thing, another element of their theology that they all pretty much had in common was salvation by grace through faith alone. So justification by grace through faith alone. Very importantly, all the, Pur all the Puritans held very strongly to a, to a covenant theology. That there is a, there's a continuity between the two testaments uh, whose, running theme is, whose running theme is the covenant of grace. Some Puritans, like, um, as, even though there were some differences, they di it did find its way into the Westminster Confession. There were some who believed in, a co there were some who believed in the covenant of works. Um, Adam and he violated that covenant of works, and then God would henceforth uh, deal with humanity by way of a covenant of grace. And it's the same covenant that runs all throughout uh, the history of Israel and the early church, except that it's administered in different ways throughout. Now some, now some Puritans uh, held, to a third, held to another covenant, and, that's called, and that was called the covenant of redemption. Now this, by the way, has very few in, in the Reformed world today hold to this covenant of redemption, but many of and not all the Puritans even held to this either, but there were some who did. And the covenant of redemption was this idea that the persons within the Trinity covenanted among themselves to redeem humanity in a particular way. So, in essence, many of the Puritans held to these three covenants. There's the covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. So, for our purposes here, we'll just write this down as abbreviated as covenant theology. Another thing for which the Puritans were known, and this directly affects us, is that they were very much known for what we call their practical divinity, their practical theology, their devotional theology. And really, that, is, that, is, that lies at the heart of their pastoral ministry. And that is what informs very significantly their pastoral ministry. It's this, pra it's this practical or devotional theology. Well, here, that's a good question, A.B. I think it's, it's, we have to be careful of reading, though, of reading issues that are largely informed by the present back into the 17th century. So I mean, I want to be, so I don't want, I don't want to characterize, I don't want to use terms like uh, complementarian, egalitarian, uh, cessationist, non-cessationist to characterize the theology of the Puritans just because those are much later, those are just much later categories. However, the Puritans would certainly believe in the male headship of home and church, as well as society. So the Puritans would by and large believe that. Now, 
Now if, now, if we want to interpret that as a type of complementarianism, quote unquote, we could. But just in terms of what they actually believed, in terms of the home and the family and all that, uh, they would hold to a male leadership. Now, in terms of your other question, to be quite honest, it's a bit di that's that's a little more com that's somewhat complex. Now, certainly they did not. Certainly, the Puritans believed in the sufficiency and finality of Scripture, as 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 resulting from their understanding of sola scriptura. They certainly would have believed that. However, the Puritans living in this period, in the late 16th, 17th century, all of whom believed in the reality of the supernatural. So because they believed in the reality of, of the supernatural, because they did believe in really in the absolute nature of God's providence, they did believe that there were occasionally extraordinary manifestations of the providence of God. That's what they would call it. And so, but they were very strict in terms of determining the legitimacy of, uh, of some of those kinds of things. So, if so, so they, now to be honest, the Puritan, many of the Puritans would have been suspicious of somebody claiming a certain kind of, um, you know, a certain kind of revelation or something like that, because of their very, very highly developed view of sola scriptura, and along with that, the sufficiency and finality of scripture. So they would, so they would, so the Puritans would be suspicious, uh, and that's one of the reasons why later on in New England, and and Hutchinson got herself in, into a, into a lot of trouble was because of alleged of her claim of alleged revelations. However, the Puritans, as I said, were not mo they were not modernists. They did believe that the Spirit of God did, did and could manifest himself in extraordinary ways. But the Puritans would probably classify that under, under, illumina under illumination. Because as you've already, as you've seen with William Perkins, there's a different. They understand the word prophecy in a very different sense. 